Okay, so the next idea I want to unpack from Anti-Fragile, and we're doing this, I guess, the, the daily set of episodes on this, and there's a long-form blog post in the show notes unpacking it all. Don't deprive things of stresses. Now, we could, we could kind of go on about this one. I think this is just like a big idea. It definitely builds on yesterday, right? Part one to this, so I think there's three parts. Look, part one, atrophy and weakness. Right? When you're too when you're too comfortable, it creates it can create this weakening. Right? And Taleb talks about this in the book. He talks about Cato the censor. He's called like a, an old Roman soldier who basically was all about this idea that you can't have too much comfort. It does start to lead to like a weakening of the will and makes people kind of softer and more vulnerable, which is actually not what we want. But I think it is interesting that in Western, the Western world, we've really optimized things for comfort more than we do for meaning. So I think a lot, a big part of like what we do is actually create more and more layers of comfort, but it can be detrimental because it's like comfort for comfort's sake. Like an example I think is potentially mental health and suicide rates. Sebastian Jung has got a book called Tribe on homecoming and belonging. And he points out that affluence corresponds with, not necessarily causes, but corresponds with higher suicide rates. If you think about it, increase like in your affluence kind of decreases the sense of interconnectedness. Like the fences of your properties get higher, your security gets more intense, you're less dependent on other people, your property gets bigger. There's literally more space between you and other people in almost every way which actually becomes counterintuitive. And that's probably why there might be higher suicide rates amongst that portion of the population, right? According to that book. So smaller examples are probably muscles, right? If you stop working out a muscle or if you stop running, right? You lose that ability. Your muscle atrophies and gets weaker, right? That's another example. So it's like, this is pretty consistent across nature. Another a great example is like a spoiled child or someone who's had it too easy. So when someone's spoiled, they get too used to things, they get expectant, and then they also get dependent because they spend all this time waiting for people to give them value uh, rather than going out and focusing on creating value and eliciting value from the world. It's kind of the idea that you know a domesticated cat won't survive in the wild if you've raised it in a house and then just release it to the wild. But if it grows up in the wild, nature has this process of kind of preparing it to survive there you know for, for, for not for forever of course but it would have better prospects i think the other thing with why you shouldn't deprive systems of stresses there's it's like the concept of a stitch in time saves nine so he talks about titanic and he, he, taleb even says he thinks we should be grateful to the titanic he goes, as fatal as it was, we would have kept building larger and larger ocean liners and the next disaster would have been more tragic. Which is actually like a fascinating and good point and probably a different way to think about tragedy. You know, like Alan Watts is the famous Chinese farmer parable, which, and we'll talk about Alan Watts and his thoughts on education later on too. But he's, don't, so it's this idea of like, don't judge your failures or successes whether they're small or large, because you don't know if, say, if, say, for example, you spilled coffee on your trousers this morning and made you late for work and the big meeting, but it might have actually saved you from getting hit by a bus on your, on your rush to work. But you'll never know. And you'll just go, damn you, God, damn you, universe. When God of the uni universe is probably standing there thinking, fuck you, I just saved your life. All right? Like it saved a bigger disaster. And the concept of like career risks I think the way people talk about like their career risks, it's actually quite funny if you take a sec to actually think about it. Because th when I was thinking about this point, I thought risk almost works like a seesaw. Like the more you try and control smaller risks, you probably create other bigger risks, if that makes sense. Like, So you, for example, are you thinking like, the risk of making a career change earlier on in your career versus staying in some a place which is comfortable and staying in there for a long time and then trying to move when, say, you're less desirable in the market, exactly. for example. Exactly. You think about it in any way. I think that 
the things you might want to control for the short term are like your, I don't know, having a consistent income, for example. I don't want to have a variable income. I want to have a consistent income. And in doing that, you're focused. And if you're the more desperate you are for that, the less picky you will be about whether a job is interesting or something like that and more about does this give me the success I'm looking for. But like a seesaw, you're, you're tipping down, you're, you're reducing like the small risks. But then the bigger risks, are, bigger risks are, is that stopping you from taking some, like say for example when you're young, clearly the best time, unless you have a very unique situation, to if it's something like starting a business or starting some other side project or anything like that, you were so much more robust to those risks when you were young. But also, risk is proportionate to reward. So you're also sacrificing the potential to kind of have a bigger, potentially have a bigger impact in the world and, and, and do something that actually pays, you know, much more in the long run because it compounds over time, right? That's the whole concept of like the traditional incentive of business on the individual level. Like for me, I just the easiest way is to apply it to me, for example, right? Because that's, that's where we can get the most specific. And I think if I wanted to optimize sort of like short-term comfort as my priority, it would definitely forbid me from doing the work I'm doing right. Say like the concert student, probably the podcast too. Um, podcast doesn't pay. And, and writing for sure. Because writing is not, writing your own stuff is not necessarily a recipe for guaranteed, you know, big payout, big paydays. But the risk, if I didn't do that stuff, if I went for say, I used to work at a bank or say I was working still in real estate, the big risk, if I kept going down that path, is I'd spend my best years of my life not doing things I think could genuinely help and a lot of people and probably creating an adventure and a story that I would be most proud of. Whereas if, if I've kind of swing, swung the other way on the seesaw, in my opinion, and I've really reduced probably the big risks. I'd say another big risk, Luke, is like not enjoying your youth, you know, not making fun for people, right? So absolutely, i controlling a lot more in the big risks, but I do open myself up to a lot of smaller risks, which is like, you know, more variable, un, you know, unexpected short-term, you know, income here and these challenges and all those other things and like am I you know not the obvious signs of progress and things like that but it's almost like choose what risks you want to choose what risks you want to optimize for because even and then you can go a layer further and say a lot of the we actually carry a lot of assumptions about our risks anyway whether this will pan out whether that will pan out Taleb has some good stuff on that too which we'll which we'll get to I just think that the quality question for example because I imagine this is something relevant, especially to younger people like us. What means even more to you than financial freedom that doesn't necessarily like exclude you from having financial freedom, right? Like uh, Joey Diaz, the comedian, was willing to be broke at 10 years at the age of 31. He said, I'm willing to be broke for 10 years if it means I can go all in on comedy, right? It didn't take him 10 years to earn a lot of money doing it, to be honest. It took him like three or five and he got a big advertising deal. But he made that commitment at the age of, of 31. Yeah. So like if there is something that looms, that is that like powerful to you. You know, I, I think at the age of 31, obviously to him, the biggest risk is not being able to do something he loves, for example. So this is why I think of it as a seesaw. Anyway, the, the third part of this, like don't, don't um, deprive yourself of stresses is this idea of actually making sure your risks are visible and you're not just like ignoring them. Because I think what a lot of people do when they try to control for a risk, something they're scared of, they actually just put the problem somewhere else. <laughs> for example, like you ignore a lump you find on your, your breast or your groin. All right, I'm not going to think about it. You've just moved the problem somewhere else. Like it's going to hit you down the road. He has a great, uh, he has a great analogy in the book. Have you read this part? The banker versus the taxi driver. Oh, this is so good. No, he I goes, haven't. No. The banker, two brothers, and one gets a bank job, one gets a taxi job, and the banker seems to have a way more secure setup. 
right? He gets a steady salary, comfortable desk job. The taxi driver, on the other hand, variable income, right? He feels his stresses. So, you know, when he's not having a good month, he doesn't get paid for a week. He has to make a change. When a person working at a bank doesn't perform well for a week, there's no change in their income. So they're not getting any sign that anything's, there's nothing wrong. And they just get, it's much easier to get comfortable, right? The problem is, so it seems like the bank has got the better deal. But the problem is when there's like the big dangerous event, like the GFC, the banker gets fired because that banker got comfortable, wasn't clear or salient enough that they were like kind of useless. Whereas the taxi driver has had short-term, you know, volatility, but ultimately survives the GFC, like in the current role. This idea is like Taleb mm. is big on the idea that empl- he's he's like employment's clearly not for me because I just don't like a lot of the stuff that happens in corporations from an ethical level too. Because a lot of employment is hiding your risks from yourself, and that's the trade-off with the stability you get. It's kind of like oftentimes we have a lot of shit happening in our economy, but we don't notice because it's preserved that everything's going fine. Right now is actually probably yeah. one of those times. Funnily enough. But before the GFC, like in 2006, all the people buying all these properties and everything like that, they don't see a problem, right? Everything's all good. So keep doing it. No reason to change the behavior. And look, it's a good point because we're always suckers for short-term thinking. The other one, before we kind of dive into unpacking this, is the turkey problem. And he talks about a turkey all year thinks that everything's all good with the farmer. This farmer loves me. The farmer feeds me all the time. Like everything's going great. And then it gets more and more and more food. It gets more and more happy right up until Thanksgiving. And then it's too late. And obviously turkeys are all served up in the States. So it's kind of like the same idea. And he has some pretty good ways of breaking it down. It's like just because you can't see the risk doesn't mean it's there. But also sometimes like you can't, you can't actually anticipate it. So, all right, interesting ideas, Joe. And, and thank you, Nick Taleb, but how do we actually make this applicable to like ourselves and what we're going to? I just think, I took the example of like the game of where do I want to be by a certain age. I think that's something that goes around a lot of people's heads. It still, still makes something I think about from time to time. It's a very seductive thing to think about and measure your life by and you make decisions according to that. But I think I come back to that Joey Diaz, Joey Diaz example for that. And like what's actually more important to you, more meaningful than the traditional markers that gets you working on things that you're actually interested in and they have a good upside for you. Not, not just like, you know, what am I, what am I doing? Like, I guess basically what it is, is the easy thing to fall into is where am I in comparison to my peers or where did I think I would be at this age? Because again, with all those other things, you, you don't necessarily know if you've had setbacks, if you're not making as much money as you thought you would, or you haven't climbed as high as you thought you would. It's impossible to actually know if that's, that could be preparing you for something even better, like that whole Titanic thought experiment. Yeah. Also, how I've done this myself. How do you, if you want to use, I want to make X amount of dollars per year as a metric for the actual thing you're going to do day to day. It's it's a very it narrow minded variable. Like it does it doesn't tell you anything about will you enjoy the process, what is it that you enjoy about work, all those different things that actually stimulate you professionally aren't taken into account when you're just looking at that yeah, exactly. salary. Exactly. That's such a good it's such an additional good additional nuance to this whole point. I think I come back to emphasizing the MVL, like the minimum viable lifestyle, which is episodes one to three of the podcast, if people haven't heard of it before. Because that's like rewriting the story, uh, what actually matters to me when you forget all the bullshit, like what's the least I need. And I think, but the other thing I think with the whole taxi driver example, most of us are too hidden. Like our feedback loop is hidden from us. You want to be getting the feedback. You just want to be able to manage it, right? You don't want it to like crush you, right? You don't need brutal, like scathing feedback every, I don't know, for me, every podcast or writing episode. Like, hey, Joe, I thought that was completely shit. It's not actually not the best. You still want to manage it, but you you certainly don't want it to be hidden from you. And like, you know, the, the easy example is like, if you never ask someone out, the guarantee is you will be alone or you almost guarantee it. 
right? There needs to be some sort of exposure, right? You need, you can't, you can't hide, you can't hide from the test results forever. You can't, you can't really hide from the feedback. You don't necessarily want to. And so I think that's a big part too. Avoidance doesn't necessarily mean removal of problems, right? Sometimes it just means relocation of the risk to somewhere else. Sometimes it can be somewhere that's more dangerous. 